Welcome to this educational video on gestational diabetes. This video focuses on a gestational diabetes protocol at Mount Sinai Hospital at the University of Toronto. My name is Dr. Miranda Bogold and I'm a fifth year endocrinology resident at the University of Toronto. My co-author for this presentation is Dr. Philip Siegel, an endocrinologist at the University of Toronto. We do not have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. The target audience for this presentation is all members of the healthcare team at Mount Sinai Hospital who care for pregnant patients with diabetes. As a disclaimer, this is a educational video and does not replace clinical judgment or guide individual patient care. The objectives for this video are for you to be able to understand your professional role and responsibilities in managing patients with gestational diabetes at Mount Sinai Hospital, with a focus on all phases of pregnancy, including antenatal, labor and delivery, as well as postpartum. First, we're gonna go through a workflow algorithm for the management of diabetes in pregnancy. And this includes all phases of pregnancy, whether or not the patient presents antepartum, intrapartum, or postpartum. The first point is when a patient reports a history of diabetes as a diagnosis, this workflow is followed. The first question to ask is, does the patient have a pre-signed paper order set for diabetes management? These are pre-signed and often patients come into hospital with them after they're completed in their outpatient endocrinology clinics. If the answer is yes, they have a pre-signed uh, pre and pre-filled paper order set, then the RN follows the pre-signed paper order set for their diabetes management. If the answer is no, uh, the next step is for the RN to complete a diabetes communication tool, which we will go through. These can be found on the units. Based on this, uh, the RN with the patient will be able to determine if the patient has gestational diabetes or type 1 or type 2 diabetes. If the patient has gestational diabetes, whether or not their diet or insulin controlled, uh, the next person of contact for the RN to call is the most responsible physician team, whether or not that's obstetrical or family medicine obstetrics. And uh, with this, there would be a conversation um, as well as initiation of that patient's management with completion of the order set. If the patient has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, the next point of contact is endocrinology. Uh, so the, uh, the RN would contact endocrinology for the patient's diabetes management and initiation and completion of a paper order set. Next, we're gonna go through the nursing communication tool. The nursing communication tool is short, one page with five key po uh, points and pieces of information that are crucial in order to begin to initiate a patient's care. The first is the type of diabetes. Um, here are some clinical features that can help you with the patient uh, determine the type of diabetes that they have. And this is outlined further in the first video here on the website. If the patient only has uh, diabetes in their pregnancy, most likely they have gestational diabetes. If they had diabetes from before their pregnancy, they may have type 2 or type 1 diabetes. The next is important to gather the information and to record the information of their current diabetes treatment. And this includes whether or not they're on insulin and on any oral agents, as well as the type of insulin and how much and when they take it. So insulin with meals as well as at bedtime, as well as to note the time and dose of their last insulin. If the patient is using an insulin pump, um, then endocrinology would be involved for their management. And it's useful if you're able to get this information to note down what the total daily dose of insulin is from their insulin pump. Uh, the next information is about uh, what stage of labor they are in, if they are in labor, as well as diet. Um, so the stage of labor, if they're in early labor, active labor, or scheduled or going to be having an, elect uh, an elective or emergency section. The next piece is diet, whether or not they're eating or NPO. And lastly, uh, the, it's very important to know what the most recent capillary blood glucose is. Um, so to record down the two most recent capillary blood glucose and when they were done. And uh, this is a paper chart uh, information and should be put into the chart once it's com completed to be included as part of the patient's medical record. Next, we're gonna talk about the patient order set. Before we go through the patient order set for gestational diabetes, how do you find this order set? The order set may be already completed, and these can be brought in by the patient when they arrive, or there may be a copy of the completed order set that's already available in triage. 
If there's no completed order set for the patient, order sets are available on the antenatal unit, in triage, as well as in labor and delivery. Of note, this may change in the future as we move more and more to an electronic system. Um, so please ask uh, your unit supervisors as well as educational leads. Next, we're going to go through the gestational diabetes order set. There's three parts to the order set. First, the antenatal phase, then labor and delivery and postpartum. First, for the antenatal phase, um, here are the orders. There's an order for a diabetic diet, as well as for a di uh, dietitian consult if the patient's on the antenatal unit. There's an order to monitor the blood sugar fasting, as well as two hours after meals. And uh, there's an order for if there's a trend that there's high blood sugar, so two blood sugars above target, fasting above 5.3, or two hour postprandial above 6.7, for a MD from the most responsible physician team to be notified and then for there to be an MD to MD consult um, so that endocrinology can be involved to help with management and recommendations. Next, there's space for you to order the diabetes therapy that the patient is on. There is space for you to indicate what type of insulin they are taking, rapid acting with their meals, and um, you put down how many units they take with each meal, as well as space for you to click off and to indicate how many units at bedtime, and as well as in the morning, if they're taking it in the morning, the long acting insulin that they are taking. Of note, if a patient is on NPH and there's no NPH um, available in the hospital for some reason, then Humulin N could be used interchangeably as long as uh, the patient doesn't have any allergies or concerns, for example. And the same goes for Humalog and Nova Rapid. They could be used interchangeably if there's any issues. Um, there's also space um, to order and to indicate any oral diabetes medications that they are taking, such as metformin or glass. Ride. There's an order here that the patient can self-administer their insulin as well as self-titrate the subcutaneous insulin with nursing supervision. And then there's also an order that if the patient is going to be given betamethasone or another type of steroid for fetal lung maturity, uh, for there to be an MD to MD consult from the most responsible physician team to endocrinology to help to see if there needs to be initiation of insulin or titration of insulin in the days afterwards to cover for that insulin resistance. The next part of the order set are the orders for active labor, C-section, or NPO. Of note, these orders are pertinent for all patients who are in any type of labor or NPO for any reason. This includes spontaneous vaginal deliveries or induction, C-section, whether or not it's elective or emergent, or NPO for any other reason, including other procedures. The orders are to discontinue all subcutaneous insulin as the patient is not eating to monitor the blood sugar every hour, Q1H, um, throughout this phase. And for if the blood sugar is above the target of seven for two consecutive hours, for IV insulin to be prepared and to be run as per the algori uh, algorithm below. There's orders here on how to mix the Humulin R, the regular insulin with D5W, and then is run as per the scale below. D5W is run at 50 milliliters an hour along with the IV insulin um, so for safety so that we know that there's always IV access and in case there's a hypoglycemic event we know that there's dextrose on board and IV access. Here is the algorithm below. Um, the capillary blood glucose is monitored every hour and based on what the blood sugar is there is an order for at what insulin dose in units per hour to be run. If the blood sugar is above 11, then this is outside of the range of this nomogram, and the order is for the IV insulin to be increased to one unit per hour, and for the physician from the most responsible physician team uh, to be notified, and then for there to be a physician-to-physician -physician consult to endocrinology to discuss if further increases in the insulin is necessary. There is also an order that if the blood sugar stays above the target of seven for more than two hours, despite them being started on IV insulin, for the RN to notify the physician from the most responsible physician team, and then for there to be a physician to physician consult to endocrinology. 
This is the last part of the order set, uh, part three, which is postpartum. This is for when the patient has delivered. When the patient has delivered and is eating, there is an order to measure the fasting as well as two hour postprandial blood sugar, capillary blood sugar once. We do this to make sure that we are not missing patients that are newly diagnosed with type two diabetes before they go home that were thought to have gestational diabetes, but actually have type two diabetes. So based on this, there's an order to notify the physician if they're high enough to make us suspicious that the patient still has diabetes even though they're postpartum. So this would be a fasting blood sugar above 7 or a 2 hour postprandial blood sugar above 11. I've known these blood sugars are a lot higher than the targets for the blood sugars anti uh, antenatally that we discussed and this is because the patient is postpartum. If the blood sugars are very high, above seven fasting or above 11 after meals, this is consistent with the patient still having diabetes. And there is an order to notify the physician from the most responsible physician team. And then for there then to be a physician to physician consult to endocrinology. So we can come and discuss with the patient and make recommendations for ongoing care. There is also an order for the patient to complete outpatient glucose testing, such as the 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test, as they were previously instructed by their outpatient endocrinologist or other MRP. Also included in the order set are the orders for the management of hypoglycemia. These orders follow the same best management principles that were discussed in the first educational video. If the capillary blood glucose is less than 3.8, then that is hypoglycemia. If the capillary blood glucose is between 2.2 and 3.7, there are orders for if they're on insulin, IV insulin, for that to be stopped. If the patient can drink, for them to be treated with juice. If the patient can't drink or is NPO, for this to be treated with D50W, IV dextrose. And with a blood sugar in this range, the order is for them to be given half of a pre-filled syringe of D50W, and that equals 25 milliliters. And this is given over two to five minutes. After the D550W is given, the blood sugar should be checked within 15 minutes. And if it's still less than uh, 3.7 for the MRP physician uh, team to be notified. If it's still low, it may be required to give more IV dextrose. When the capillary blood glucose is greater or equal to 3.8, then the hypoglycemia is successfully treated. And if they were on IV insulin, this can be restarted. If the capillary blood glucose is very low, less than 2.2, there's once again an order to stop IV insulin if they're on it. If they can drink, treat it with oral juice. If they're NPO or cannot drink, to treat with IV dextrose. Once again with D50W, but this time the whole pre-filled syringe, which is 50 milliliters, is given over two to five minutes. Given that the blood sugar is very low, uh, there's a recommendation to notify the physician team for the MRP team and for the blood sugar to be checked sooner in five minutes. And if it's still low, less than 2.2 to treat the hypoglycemia again with either more juice or more D50W. And once again, once the blood sugar is over 3.8, then uh, the hypoglycemia has been treated and the IV insulin can be restarted if they were on it. If a patient was started on IV insulin because their blood sugar was above seven in labor and delivery, there is an order that as soon as the patient delivers or goes to C-section that the IV insulin and the accompanying D5W is stopped, as we know that their insulin requirements are going to drop as soon as they deliver. There's an order to check the capillary blood glucose post-delivery and to notify the physician team for the MRP team if uh, there is a blood sugar less than 3.8 or above 11. Here is what the order set looks like when it's all together on one page. As you can see, there is uh, the first, second, and third section, which covers all of the phases of uh, the management of gestational diabetes, antenatally, in labor and delivery, as well as postpartum. And there is space at the bottom for the physician to sign um, date and time, as well as to indicate their designation. Thank you for watching this educational video. If you are a trainee from Mount Sinai Hospital, please print this uh, confirmation of completion certificate, which is available on the website and give it to the appropriate educational supervisor at Mount Sinai Hospital. Thank you.